Hello and welcome to Crack and Krakoa number three. This is my attempt to explore, explain, and just enthuse about House of X and Powers of Ten, the 2019 ongoing series written by Jonathan Hickman, in which the X-Men franchise over at Marvel Comics is undergoing some major, major changes. Now, as you should have seen in the title, today we're going to explore the history of the X-Men supporting character for a good long time, Myra McTaggart, who it's been revealed is going to have a much larger role in the coming of um, remaining issues of House of X and Powers of Ten. I'll pause here and say, if you haven't read House of X, numbers one and two, and Powers of Ten, number one and two, those are the issues that have been released to date. I'm going to be talking about them in detail in addition to reviewing the the content that has been published um, involving Myron McTaggart in Marvel Comics history. If you just want the essential Myra stories, what I would recommend you do is you check out this reading order that I am publishing over here on comicbookherald.com. I'll have the link in the show notes. That is largely spoiler-free conversation about Myra's history from the late 70s on through to present day. But what I'm going to be doing in the video and in the podcast here that I'm recording is actually talking about the the ways that house of x number two which is a myra focused issue sort of maybe change our perspectives on some of these things as we review the history so again i'm dave busing founder and editor-in-chief of comicbookherald.com thanks for checking out the content here i've been having a lot of fun going deep on house of x and powers of 10 material i did receive several reading order requests for myra mctaggart in the aftermath of house of x number two which i will admit is the first time i've received reading order requests for Myra McTaggart in in approximately the eight years I've been doing Comic Book Herald. Um, but it was honestly a lot of fun to go back and read this one because Myra's got a long and fairly interesting history in X-Men that is now really cast under a new light with what happened in House of X number two. So again, if you haven't read this, is your chance. Bail now. If you have, let's talk about it. House of X number two is, of course, called The, the Uncanny Life of of Moira X and you know the one thing or one of the many things that it shows us is this idea that Moira has been a major player in X-Men history in that she has a mutant power she's a mutant herself which has never been revealed and she has the ability to reincarnate essentially and we get in a conversation with Destiny in one of her lives this idea that she has 10 lives to lead, which really fits in with, of course, the powers of 10 and just this factors of 10 idea that Jonathan Hickman is playing with as a writer, right? But we get, you know, the idea that in one of her timelines, she sought out Apocalypse. So there's all sorts of different lives that Myra has been going through um, as, as like trying to figure out basically how to prevent mutant genocide into the future. She sought out Magneto. She sought out Professor X and she sought out Apocalypse as we're seeing this image here. So She's gone through nine lives. Now, she presumably, she's on life number 10, and that's kind of the situation we find ourselves in with the ongoing House of X and Powers of 10 series. So if you're interested in learning more about Myra now that she's such a key player in the Marvel Universe, again, like I said, I've got this reading order going up on comicbookherald.com. In the meantime, I will share some of the highlights, and I will, I'll focus in here, I think, on some of the ones that are most interesting to me with the revelation of of House of X number two, right? So like Myra appears effectively in X-Men comics almost from jump with the Chris Claremont written era with Dave Cockerman art initially of Uncanny X-Men. She's introduced in Uncanny X-Men number 96. Her debut here is really, really awesome, actually. She is um, she shows up announced as the X-Men's new housekeeper. So this is the, the period in time. It's the all-new, all-different X-Men had just started. It's Wolverine, Nightcrawler, Storm, uh, Colossus, of course, a few others I'm forgetting, Thunderbird, um, Cyclops, and, and Banshee is around as well. And Professor X, for reasons that are relatively unclear, announces her initially as their housekeeper. She shows up full of fire. She's instantly charismatic and interesting. And within, like, I don't know, like six panels or something like that, she's rushing a demon with a machine gun. It's it's genuinely amazing. Again, all this takes place in Uncanny X-Men number six, or number 96, excuse me, and then she's got a role in Uncanny X-Men, you know, for a pretty healthy amount of time. One of the issues I'll call out as the most prominent examples 
of her time is in 104. We get this idea that she, um, well, first we get the introduction of Muir Island and the Mutant Research Center Center that she is housing there. Cyclops is kind of salty because it's the first time he's hearing about it, and he's been around for 104-ish issues of X-Men. But uh, basically it's this revelation that, no, Myra's not just a housekeeper. She's got a history with Professor X, both romantic and otherwise, as we'll find. Um, and and she's actually, like, has a very relevant role in terms of advancing mutant rights and mutant research. And on Muir Island there, we uncover in 104 that she'd been experimenting, kind of, on Magneto uh, when he was, in a complex series of twists, turned into a baby in the pages of Defenders number 16. And she had been trying to sort of mess with his DNA, and this will come up later, um, to see, like, basically, could he live a second life and live it well, you know, and live it not as the evil arch villain, which I think is actually quite interesting given the context of what we know now that Myra is very familiar with living multiple lives. And this is something that obviously is, is innate to her mutant ability. So trying to give that to Magneto, who is not very happy when he uncovers the fact that she'd been messing with his life. Uh, and, and he kind of really rails against that in all the way in 1991's X-Men number two. But before we get to that, in X-Men, Uncanny X-Men number 116, and we're now in the the Chris Claremont written, John Byrne drawn era, we get one page in this kind of Professor X-focused origin issue about the romance that he had with Myra. And this is touched on a lot in House of X number two, but this is, you know, this is the idea that they had fallen in love, they were engaged, and then when Professor X was drafted and called to war, Myra uh, called it off, kind of without without really explaining herself. And there's an interesting detail, and I don't remember if it's this issue or another, I call it out in the reading order, but they don't reconvene until 10 years later, which is probably just a meaningless coincidence, except for the fact that everything here is factors of 10 and i refuse to allow that to be nothing but a coincidence and actually i misspoke there i've got listed here uncanny x-men number 117 so that's the kind of when myra met charles i think the interesting thing that that sets up the professor x and myra romance is this idea that comes in uncanny x-men number 125 to number 128 and it's the proteus saga and this story is all about, you know, Myra's working in her mutant research center, and there's this mutant there called Mutant X that kind of nobody knows about, but he escapes. And it turns out in the course of this saga that um, this mutant is is actually Myra's son, Proteus, okay? And he's like this reality-warping, extremely powerful, extremely dangerous mutant and myra had him via uh like i think the way the text plays is a sexual assault with her abusive husband joseph mctaggart which is where she gets her last name the mctaggart is not her maiden name i believe it's kinross or something like that um but so myra she had this child proteus and i think it's interesting calling out because it, it was this part of her plan i mean as someone who has lived nine lives to this point is Proteus, this reality-warping son of hers, that she is ready and willing to kill, you know? So here's, like, I've got this panel up here of in Uncanny, it's either 126 or 127. She's got her sniper skills at work. She's got her assassination training that she probably perfected in one of her lives, taking out the Trasks. She's got it honed in on her own son, and Cyclops stops her, you know, seeing her about to commit a murder. He, he decides that that is not befitting of the X-Men, which I understand. But the question I'm wondering is, did Myra... It, it's complicated. I wonder how they're going to deal with this because you've got an abusive relationship here with Joe McTaggart, a man she pulls a gun on when when she has to go and confront him again because of their violent, violent history. You know, in these pages, too, Myra and Joseph are still married, um, and Joseph doesn't know about Proteus, and Myra wants it that way, um, but it's an extremely complicated situation. So I think there's a part of me that likes the idea of Myra's, because of what we know of her now, like planning and, and thinking that, okay, Proteus is going to play a role here, This re maybe this reality-warping uh, like thing that they didn't have in the previous nine timelines. But the way that they get there in Uncanny X-Men, I wonder if this is going to be reconfigured or, or changed in some way because it's obviously very, very um, distasteful. I mean, Joe McTaggart is a monster, and it is rough stuff to think of Myra going through nine lifelines and then and then winding up with him 
as the father of her child. Okay, so that's that's definitely the biggest early Myra story that you can read is Uncanny X-Men 125 to 128. I've got listed here on the order again um, that I'll share out. It, Classic X-Men number 36, which was published nearly a decade later, functions really, really well as a follow-up to this story. It's written by Fabian Nichiza. And, uh, and there's no way I said that right, so feel free to, to let me know how you actually say that. Um, but this, this is an epilogue to the Proteus Saga, and it's actually very, very interesting because not only do you get Myra's, you know, sort of her emotional reaction to the death of Proteus, or, or so it seems, at the hands of his one weakness, um, Metal, and, and at the hands of Colossus, but you get these uh, images of Myra considering reincarnating? Proteus so she's considering cloning him and this is something that actually comes up a multi like a handful of times uh throughout Myers history is she's she's really very good at clones as it turns out and here too we see her thinking about giving her son Kevin Proteus a second chance you know and and throughout the issue we'll find the Banshee kind of comes in and talks her out of it but I wonder there will be some but did she actually stop the procedure as we see in this issue or did she give someone else a second lifeline because now we know this is something that she is obviously extremely familiar with so i think classic x-men has the potential to be a major player in the the ongoing saga of myra mctaggart in the pages of house of x and powers of 10 as well okay so those are the, that's the biggest myra story from there she becomes a really regular player in the pages of new mutants um in the launch of the new mutants original graphic novel that kicks off that new team uh we get her connections to rain sinclair who she eventually will take on as her ward she adopts rain who is an orphan uh she kind of talks charles into forming the new mutants which again i think knowing that you know charles and myra here are very much co-collaborators in in all things mutant related starting the new mutants there certainly seems relevant uh, and also she has a major role in taking care of legion who is one of her patients at the mutant research center and we get some really great stories there in new mutants 26 to number 28 that are of course professor x and legion focused but with a nice side helping of myra as well there's also in the 80s the series fallen angels uh in which myra sort of takes on a role of consulting Magneto on how to deal with teenagers, <laughs> which isn't a major Myra plot by any measure, uh, but it's pretty fun. And uh, it's nice to see, you know, the I think knowing now too, Magneto's kind of a part of, of the plotting of Professor X and Myra in terms of the future of mutant kind. It's interesting to see the the sort of hero teacher Magneto phase when, you know, there's this moment post Uncanny X-Men number 200 where Magneto actually takes over as the teacher of the new mutants in X-Men history. And it actually offers kind of an interesting viewpoint to see him conversing with Myra knowing that they've had these major conversations, uh, you know, sort of in secret as well. So those are the biggest Myra in the 80s stories. From there we go to the 90s. We get the Muir Island X-Men. This occurs during a period of time where, um, again, like basically everyone's missing. <laughs> Professor X, the X-Men, like everyone's kind of off the radar. I believe this is during the period of time where the X-Men are primarily based out of Australia. But you have Myra actually attempting to put together sort of her own um as I said, Muir Island X-Men. And a few things happen here. One, Myra really takes charge. Two, her outfits just go out of control. Myra is dressing up while performing science. It is something to see. Again, this is Uncanny X-Men number 253 to number 255 is the most prominent version of the story here. And these are actually interesting issues to connect to House of X number two because they really involve the um, what they were going by at the time. Oh, I'm going to get this wrong. Uh, Freedom Force, I believe, Mystique and Blob and Pyro and Destiny. And, of course, we know from House of X number two, Destiny had that really interesting scathing conversation with Myron McTaggart. Issues 255 in particular uh, is a big one for the mystique and destiny dynamic okay from there there's the Muir island saga which is not the best and not even the most Meyer focused um but again it's on Muir island so therefore she is involved uh she there is a moment kind of in the epilogue when the team is dealt with legion and the shadow king and everything that happens in the Muir island saga when myra tells wolverine to put out a cigarette and because he's smoking it indoors while she's uh you know operating in a, a medical capacity on professor x and wolverine 
does this in the most childish way possible that only he could do by actually just straight up eating the SIG. <laughs> so, uh, good one, Logan. You really showed her, I guess. Um, it's it's wild and not worth reading the entire Mural Island saga for. The 90s are tough because X-Men number two, again, we have this reckoning of Magneto really confronting Myra over what she has done to him and, and to his DNA. And again, this is the return to arch villainy for Magneto. It's it's hard for me currently to reconcile, you know, seemingly Professor X and Myra and Magneto have been planning together what's going to happen, you know, in this House of X state of affairs. I think it's, it's plausible to imagine a scenario where Magneto, because he, he calls this out actually in Powers of Ten, number two, like, Basically, if they step out of line or they, he seems to think that they're not fully committed to the mutant cause in the way that he is, that he will absolutely still play the role of the quote-unquote villain to them. So I could see them explaining it that way, but it's it's a little odd to see, like, they probably they probably have been working together more than anyone would have suspected in 1991. Nonetheless, that's a big moment. Myra admits to everything, of course. And and again, like she, this idea that she was trying to give Magneto a second life, which is sort of, again, m- accidental coincidence in retrospect. But I do think it ties in interestingly to this character, who obviously her mutant ability is additional lifelines. The biggest thing and really the most common way to find Myra in the 90s in the, is in the pages of Excalibur, uh, which is a... a team up book between like Captain Britain and Nightcrawler and Kitty Pride and uh, the team relocates to Muir Island at a certain point in the in the 90s really post fatal attractions which is like 1994 so you're going to start with like uh, I think Excalibur 71 and you know again Myra's not like in every page or a huge part of Excalibur but the team is there on Muir Island and she is working with them in things like the Warren Ellis written Soul Saga or Soul Sword trilogy in which um, we get, you know, cool moments like Kitty Pride raiding Myra's closet, stealing her clothes and stealing her cigarettes. Yes, that did, in fact, happen. So the, uh, the second thing second thing like i haven't been talking for hours uh the next thing that happens in the 90s is the legacy virus is a huge thing in the world of x-men it's this thing that is you know potentially killing mutants and humans alike and myra is one of the foremost scientists i think really alongside hank mccoy beast in investigating this she uh, actually takes it upon herself in excalibur number 115 she locks herself basically in like a spacesuit in a room and is going to work on the virus which leads to the biggest Myra story of the late 90s into the early 2000s has been collected as something called X-Men Dreams End, and this is the apparent demise of Moira McTaggart. Of course, Charlie, Professor Xavier, quite distraught over the apparent death of Myra. Uh, She basically turns into like a ghost at this point, and Professor X, for a series of pages, will not allow her to dissipate. I think... It's interesting in retrospect, given the timeline we see in House of X, there's a listing there that says it was a fake out, right? That says it was actually Shear Gollum and that Myra's been alive this entire time. The questions I have here are, did Professor X know? Because he certainly played the part like he did not, and I would not put it past Myra McTaggart to have actually not told anyone and for this to be a part of her plan all along, where she spent the years, you know, the publication years, of, of Marvel X-Men comics in our own timeline of 2001 to 2018, kind of behind the scenes operating in the world of House of X. I think that would actually be very interesting. The rest of the 2000s are full of like kind of weird uh, cameos in which Myra comes back for the dead, or in some cases like X-Men Deadly Genesis, you know, there might be flashbacks to her role as, um, you know, kind of influencing the the origins of the X-Men alongside Professor X. I think my personal favorite here is, um, is Myra forming a book club with uh, fellow dead Marvel women, Mockingbird, and Gwen Stacy at the time, and she makes them all read Ulysses, which is a bold play, Myra, for a book club. Uh, Let's pick something a little lighter next time. I think everyone can agree. So that brings us up to House of X, which is where we are today. So there you have it. It's the history of Myra McTaggart 
in brief uh, in, in about 20 minutes or so, which isn't bad because that's a lot of comics you can read through. Uh, so hopefully that gives you some insight into where Myra McTaggart is coming from. I realize now at the very end of this that I basically didn't say what she is, which is extremely capable geneticist and scientist, and she's a Nobel Prize winner, and it uh, turns out she's extremely capable of taking care of herself with uh, heavy weaponry. So we did see some of that as well. But again, if you want to see what's happening... With her right now, you can check out the ongoing House of X and Powers of Ten series. Again, I've got a whole reading order guide and Road to Prep over on comicbookherald.com. You can check out those links in the show notes. Uh, if you like what I'm doing here with the Crack and Krakoa series, let me know. You can find me pretty much anywhere at Comic Book Herald. You can go on over to comicbookherald.com and talk about the comment, comment, blah, blah, blah. comics, content there uh otherwise you know you can like and subscribe here on youtube you can check out the podcast on best comics ever um or again you can go on over to patreon.com slash comic book herald if you're interested in supporting the show and finding out a little bit more about cool bonuses so that's been the uncanny life of myra x i hope you've enjoyed and i'll be around here talking x-men comics and talking comics in general on comic book herald thanks for listening everybody and enjoy the comics <laughs>